Ready. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. We'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Since this is our first meeting after the election where Peter Quigley was the resounding winner of the town election for school committee member, um, what we do is open up by taking nominations for the chair position. So if anybody wants to nominate. Okay, well, well um, I'd like to nominate Kelly as chairman of the school committee for the coming year. Um, I uh, have spoken with Peter and I know that he is um, confident in your ability to continue and um, you will provide some continuity from the current year into the next year. Um, and you have great experience uh, in the schools and in the community, so I feel like that would be a great um, appointment if you're agreeable. Do nominations need to be seconded? It's a very loud mic. Well, first we have to see if there are any other nominations. Oh. Well. <laughs> okay. No. Now they can be seconded. <laughs> Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and then for vice chair, um, I actually would like to nominate Julia, who um, Julia's been great to work with and puts in an inordinate amount of time and is an excellent resource on many fronts. And um, I would love to have you as my vice chair. Thank you. Any other? <laughs> okay, do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. Um, on the agenda, we're going to jump down to our action items to um, approve the overnight field trips so that um, the folks representing those do not have to wait. Um, first, we have the boys lacrosse trip. And that is um, an overnight trip to play a game to it's New York, right? Yeah, it's just it's no, it's standard. It's a scrimmage they played before, but it's, it's an overnight trip. Right. They, always have the school they incur all costs. Um, so if we have a motion to accept the overnight field trip. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then the second trip is the world language um, trip, Massachusetts Junior Classical League competition. It, it, uh, this is really, a, I mean, fully recommend approving this, but um, uh, Michael Collin, Peter George, came who are sort of sponsoring it. And do they thank wanna, you for coming. Do, do they want to speak about it or? Anything you want to add, gentlemen, or? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Yeah. yeah, it looks neat. Yeah. Very academic and, uh, and fun. So um, all those in favor of the world language trip? Do you need to move? Oh, sorry. Can we have a motion? I move to approve the world language trip as proposed. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. Do not hesitate to leave if you want. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to stay, too. We're a thick-skinned group. We're never offended. Um, okay. Next up, we have approval of the minutes. Um, uh, let's do March 7th first. Just, have, you know, have you been able to read through them? Yeah. The, the only thing that I wondered was, um, says that uh, you, uh, Shannon and Peter were available by Skype. It was you were on the telephone. I was on the phone, um, okay. and Peter was using some other software. But I, so well, you I'm had them both on via. Did you have both? You had. I thought you coordinated. I can't I, it, it was. It's one of these things where I called in, he videoed in, but it was the same technology. Yeah, so I would. Right. I would just say they. Yeah, they, um, remote. Yeah. Remote. Yeah. remote yeah. Just remote participation or however, however you want to phrase it. Yeah. But other than that, I didn't have any, any comments. Okay. 
I move that we approve the meetings of March 7th, 20, 2018. 7th and 14th. Right. Oh, you did the 14th just too? Well, yeah. I just did the 7th oh, first. Right, sorry. A second. Um, all those in favor of March 7th, 2018? Aye. 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 All right, and then March 14th, any discussion on? Mm -hmm. No? Pretty clear? Okay. Can we have a motion to approve those? I move that we uh, approve the minutes of March 14th, 2018. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, now we, um, for those who haven't been here, we have public comment at the beginning of the meeting and also at the end to give folks an opportunity if they want to say something and leave or if something comes up during the meeting. So, um, Martha, you look like you're the public. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any public comment tonight? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so reports for the school committee. Dr. Antonucci, take it away. Yeah, so just a few things. And I think the most exciting thing, um, and I didn't realize she was going to be here tonight, but you all know that um, <laughs> yesterday announced that uh, Sarah McGuire, the interim high school principal right now and in long-time social studies, um, Subject supervisor has been named the new principal um, of Dutch Bay Middle School. And um, so, first, congratulations. Yeah. To I, um, I'm, I, I just want to say I'm very excited uh, about the choice. I mean, Sarah, um, you know, as I said in the, in the, in the release from memoirs of the staff, she, she um, just exhibits great leadership skills. I mean, she really has an academic. So the academic credentials and, and the teaching and learning skills, but she also has the intangible leadership skills. You know, she's passionate, she's got great instincts, um, she just works well with people, she's an exceptional communicator, and all those things um, are characteristics that we, we uh, needed and, and identified as uh, wanting in our next leader in Dr. Wayne Middle School. And so I, I think Sarah so own the process, and I'm very excited to have her on board. And I just want to really comment too about the process because I, I think it's really important. Um, and I hope people who participated agree, but I, it was about as inclusive and thorough a process um, as you can have. And I, I think it's important. And I, I, you all know I made a commitment to really engage the community to the extent we can in everything we do. And this is just one example. Um, before the search even started, Tim and I held forums with faculty and staff and forums with parents. Uh, where people have the opportunity to weigh in on what they were looking for in, in the next in the next leader of the school. And that was very informative for us. Um, helped us develop the leadership profile, for lack of a better term. Um, but during the process, you know, naturally, we had a search committee, a 15-member, pretty large search committee, representative search committee, school committee, representation, parents, teachers, administrators. Um, that committee forwarded originally four finalists to me, because ultimately it's the superintendent's decision, one candidate ended up withdrawing. But in the finalist round, we invited the finalists back to the district for the day. And it's, it's the gauntlet. I mean, Sarah, I can attest to that. It's, it's, it's a pretty challenging day. But the key to that day is that um, we exposed the candidates, and they are exposed to several different constituent groups. So we had, um, again, another parent forum. Uh, we had a faculty and staff forum. We had meetings all day with administrators. We had walkthroughs of the building. And anybody that interacts with the candidates, I gave them the opportunity to provide written feedback to me. And I probably got over 100 pieces of written feedback from all the candidates. And again, ultimately, it's my decision. <coughs> um, but it, it's really helpful um, to hear from the school community. So you know, I stand by this process. It's one I've used uh, in the past. Like, I think I, I kind of tweak it every time I've um, implemented it. But I think, importantly, um, you know, we not only engage your community, but we land the best candidate. Uh, and in this case, the best candidate was Sarah McGuire. So um, yeah, I mean, that's really good about that. I think it's really Great. exciting. Yeah. So. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Martha, actually, I know I don't mean to put you on the spot. She was part of the, for, you know, she was part of the parent forums. And, I don't know what you think about it, but it's, it's valuable, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the parents will be there all that's okay. So that's the good news of the week um, for that. Any questions about that? No. No. Right. 
and um, just two other uh, two other quick things. Um, since we saw you last, uh, Tim, uh, Tim and I and Jim Donovan uh, had a really nice meeting uh, at Over Highland Creek Oysters, um, just uh, just to talk to the owners of uh, you know Chris and Skip about ways that we could potentially collaborate with them, um, especially as it relates to more project-based or experiential learning opportunities. And besides with their expertise and what they do, their, their new facilities, I think, really lend themselves to more educational opportunities. Um, and so, I don't know, it's just, we don't really have anything to, nothing specific that came out of it, but it's, it's really exciting. We really appreciate their time. And, uh, it's just an amazing company. Mm -hmm. we, we see a lot of potential, uh, potential opportunities to do that. So anyway, thanks to them, but also I just want to let you know we're, Great. we're in, in those conversations. And then, um, yeah, that's really it for tonight. All right, great. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I have uh, four or five things. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that the uh, Department of Ed, in conjunction with the STEM Education Center at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, uh, recently sought applicants to represent Massachusetts on a new math and science technology engineering ambassador team. Uh, over the last two years, Massachusetts has adopted a new math and science technology engineering curriculum frameworks, and the ambassadors who have been selected will be a part of the implementation acro process across the state. Um, so I'm pleased to say that our own Kathy McCarthy was nominated and has been selected to serve as one of the science technology engineering ambassadors. I'm very proud of Mrs. McCarthy's willingness to be considered for such an important uh, assignment, and I'm thrilled that she was selected from a very diverse and competitive pool of applicants. Uh, since we last met, Dr. Antonucci and I would uh, asked if I would chair the two interview committees, um, assistant superintendent and middle school principal, and I hope uh, that each of you is pleased, as I am, with the results of both. I know Dr. Antonucci will have an incredibly strong partner in Dr. Klingerman, and I have every confidence that DMS will be in very good hands with Ms. McGuire. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the parents, the teachers, and administrators who served on both committees. The members of the interview teams made the work fun. I thought it was fun. I thought it was fun. I thought it was fun too. Good. Uh, at various points during the past nine months, I've talked about the potential for a summer professional development program. You've heard me talk about that, right? So uh, this is the program uh, for teachers taught by Duxbury teachers. Uh, and I'm j I've just given you a, a packet that describes the brochure itself and the various offerings. Uh, and I would like also to take a moment to thank each of the Duxbury teachers uh, who is taking this risk of presenting to their peers. This will occur uh, both the first week after school is out, beginning on June 25th, and also the third week in August, the week prior to coming back. So those were the two weeks selected. Uh, earlier this week, I met with the district's curriculum committee. For whatever reason, student involvement on that particular committee uh, has waned during this year. However, uh, during the past two weeks, and a huge thank you to Mr. Donovan for his help, uh, we've secured three new uh, Duxbury High School student leaders to serve on the curriculum review team. So we meet again on May 10th, and they've all been invited to join us on that day. Are they different grades or same? Um, they're know? not seniors. <laughs> it's a good I, I don't know what grades they're in. Do you, Jim? Just curious. Um, I think Abby, sophomore. Matt? Yeah, two sophomores and a junior. Oh, great. Okay. Great. Uh, work is also underway to prepare for the new teacher orientation that will take place in late August, as well as scheduling the second year teacher course that uh, Cheryl teaches. Uh, that's going to take place the week of June 25th and into the next school year. So uh, we've also obviously been deeply involved in the digital learning review, and you'll hear more about that tonight. Mr. Pro. Yes. what have you? All right, little information. Um, today we found out that we might be getting some extra money for FY uh, 17, 18 year circuit breaker. Uh, currently we're at 65% reimbursement at 892,000. We could maybe get 75%, which is about $137,000 more. So it's a little over a million dollars. That's this year. 
So hopefully our fingers are crossed, the state will uh, up it from 65 to 75%. Uh, currently for FY18-19 circuit breaker, it says 65% reimbursement and uh, potentially around $812,000 for next year. Uh, the governor's budget is still out, and it's only up about $60,000 for Duxbury, uh, which is about $20 per student. Uh, and the next school committee, I'll bring a third quarter uh, projection for you. Great. Okay. Right. okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Yep, that all okay. sounds good. Tanner, what's going on with the kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So um, today marks the end of the third term as grades close and teachers will have until the 10th to finish grading papers. And it's um, hard to believe that we're in the last term already. So course selection begins today for high schoolers and they'll have the opportunity to choose electives from anything from piano lab to forensics to um, gym classes. Um, and then also students who applied for advanced placement classes were notified yesterday that the, if they made it into the class. And on Monday, uh, the Dexter Student Council hosted the spring conference called CMASC, and CMASC stands for Southeastern, Conf um, sorry, Southeastern Massachusetts Association of Student Council. And uh, that was really fun, and it's a chance for student councils to get together and collaborate um, and it also teaches leadership skills along the way. There's a lot of elections for different spots on the CMASC board. And the Sophomore Student Council is putting on their event of the year called Touch Truck, which is coming up, and that's on May 5th. It is benefiting Crossroads for Kids as well as Student Council, and um, we're really looking forward to that. Um, spring sports officially started last week as tryouts ended and the following spring sports are track and field, lacrosse, baseball, sailing, tennis, girls golf, and softball. And as far as music goes, there's an upcoming concert band concert on April 10th at 7.30 and an orchestra concert on the 11th at 7.30. And lastly, uh, there will be no school April 16th to the 20th for spring break. That's everything. Just a quick follow-up to Tanner. That, that CMAS conference was unbelievable. Yeah, it's really Mr. cool. Mr. Duggan and I had the chance to be there for a while, and uh, there was 450 kids, yeah. I think. It was the highest energy group of kids. <laughs> um, it was just it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a, a bunch of brilliant um, kids and you know, future leaders, which uh, it was really inspiring. So I did, I, I'm sure you had a blast. It was really, yeah. Really yeah, it was really fun. I think Jim or somebody tweeted out a picture. It was great. Somebody put a picture on Twitter of yeah, the conference. Jim was yeah, Jim tweeting a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Good video for dancing. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I want to follow just real quickly is spring sports started today. And um, when I was in Westwood, uh, our girls across team won six state championships when I was superintendent. And today, the Duxbury Fields across team beat Westwood for the first time in program history. Wow. I'd like wow. to attribute that to district wide leadership. <laughs> 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 I must say, back in, must have been 1982 or 1983, I attended a mass conference at uh, Acton Boxborough High School. So there you go. The kids become the leaders, right? Um, so for my chair report, I don't really have a lot. I always just jot down things that I want to talk about at the meeting. Um, but I had spoken to John. I was thinking we should probably have a permanent um, agenda item um, regarding the budget, because we tend to talk a lot about the budget at our meetings. So if we could just have budget subcommittee check-ins, that makes sense. Okay, then John and I can we can add that to the agenda. You think from now on? Yeah, no, I think it's good to have a standing agenda item. Not necessarily. I, I really. It could be. I, I think part of our process discussion needs to be sort of getting away from separating the budget for exactly. months, right? No. So, yeah, it can't but be. I, I, I hear you on the check-ins, um, Just but maybe it's like we have it, and then if there's something to add, we do, but I, I think we need to have a better process. Yes. I don't know if you guys have done. Yes. Do yeah. 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 And then, um, in regards to that, we had talked about having another meeting. Yes. Um, to sort of figure out what our game plan is going to be going forward. 
Yeah. And so the two dates, every everybody seems to um, be available May 9th or May 23rd. So I don't know if any if you have a preference. Before. Have we heard from Matt? Yeah, yeah, I've heard from everyone. Okay. Okay. Yes. So I don't have a preference. So, so those two dates were fine. If, if I, I do a preference of May yeah. 23rd, if possible, I can make 9th and 9th or 2. May 23rd okay. is fine with me. Yeah. And also, and I, I did talk to Peter um, today, and, and I would like to invite uh, our administrative team and certainly uh, Danielle Clinton and two to, to attend that. And hopefully, she's available. I think, I think she is on the Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Okay. All right, great. So we'll shoot for May 23rd. Great. Okay. Um, and we'll do maritime school or somewhere again. We'll yeah, an open, yeah, more of a retreat. Um, but it, but it'll be a an open, scheduled meeting. Great. All right. Awesome. And then um, I just I'm a big um, public radio person, so I was driving home from Vermont four hours Tuesday, listening to New Hampshire Public Radio, and they were covering um, the crisis in Oklahoma with teachers in their contracts. And I just, what, what we just went through with the budget and um, it just really is striking to me where they've got in there, in Oklahoma and in Arizona, their teachers are making about $30,000 a year, which is insane. And they drive Uber in the morning and they go into their classroom and then they work another job at night. And i um, pretty sure West Virginia just went on strike and they did get a raise, but their budget, their school budgets are not being funded. So just um, kind of a, a cautionary tale on public education and, and they're all saying we're at the breaking point. Kids deserve better and we just can't do this. So um, I consider myself fortunate to live in Massachusetts and, and I hope that we can continue to uh, provide our school and staff with the resources they need to give our kids the best we can. All right, so, da 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 da. Report on digital, oh, and I, I was remiss in not um, explaining that Peter Quigley is home sick tonight and Matt Gambino is on an airplane because he was traveling for work, so that's why there's only three of us. Um, okay, report on digital literacy program review from Jeff Sun of Sun Associates. Um, before Jeff starts, if yes. I may, just to, I'd like to give a little bit of uh, background and context. Mm -hmm. For This is primarily for those at home who are what, riveted and watching and yeah. can't, can't <laughs> wait to learn more about our digital learning program. Um, you probably already know this, but I, I felt it was important for the community. So let me just start with a, a little bit of history as well as the purpose of the review itself. Uh, this is a curricular review. The du uh, Duxbury Public Schools created a review cycle approximately five years ago when the digital literacy program was added to that cycle. Another purpose, one purpose of the review was to identify where the digital literacy standards are being taught and with what level of sophistication. This review is not a referendum on devices and or comparative study <coughs> of available devices. It may, however, inform future purchasing decisions, uh, and I think it, there's lots in it that will allow that to occur, but this, is not, this report is not a referendum on Apple or Google or, or whatever. As the curriculum review cycle currently covers a five-year span of time, most of the history that I'm gonna talk about in just a moment shared does not go back uh, much beyond that five years. Up until 2016, the state had technology literacy standards for grades uh, pre-K pre to 12. And I don't know if I'm gonna be able to toggle back and forth between these things effectively, but I wanted to share with you, here in Duxbury, two assistant superintendents ago, I believe, uh, created this document, which, I, which identifies three primary standards associated with, at that time, it was just called technology literacy. And then at what grade level are each of the skill sets behind each of those standards taught? So you can see there's a K2 span, a grades three, five span, and at what grade is each standard and skill taught? There's a grade six through eight span and uh, nine through 12. And these other pages at the bottom 
simply break it out by grade level. So this is just grades six through eight, for example. But I, I mentioned this simply because I wanted to acknowledge that um, standards do exist and did exist in the Duxbury Public Schools uh, as far back as 2008 or, or even previous to that, uh, how much they're used and or how visible and, and available they are is something that will be talked about, I'm sure, when Jeff speaks and, um, and, and so forth. So that's that. Now I'll see if I can toggle back. Rita Marie, among other people in the district, is uh, she tends to be a tremendous fount of knowledge and history. So when I was asking about standards prior to the 2016 standards that were published by the Department of Ed, of course, Rita Marie was the one who was able to put her hands right on the electronic file and share. Uh, and sh she referred to them as the green and yellow cards. The teachers had them on green and yellow poster boards in their classrooms. So just a little bit more uh, history. The three standards themselves that were part of these 2008, very basic. One deals with the proficiency in the use of computers and applications. Another talks about the responsible use as primarily ethics and safety. And the third standard is primarily uh, more of the upper level, uh, higher level thinking skills, creativity, problem solving, solving decision making and so forth. So those standards were around in 2014 when Duxbury opens its new middle high school facility. And I wanted to acknowledge with that opening, and I, I guess with just that era, comes a lot of other things that the district did uh, to promote technology and to share concepts in the district there was this uh, group called Tech Thursdays that would get together and brainstorm and problem solve uh, various technology issues throughout the district. Wired Wednesdays, professional development, sharing information. Uh, Apple Corps training was brought to the district and we do have a number of certified staff uh, in the Apple Corps program. We had summer PD called Tech Camp. Uh, so it was largely to familiarize and promote the use of technology in our classrooms. But along with the, the, the variety of professional development was going on, there's also the responding to a lot of stops and starts associated with the efficiency of technology use. Uh, when you open a brand new school, everything doesn't work beautifully just because you've turned them off, turned the devices on. So there was a lot of that kind of uh, work that needed to be done to resolve connectivity issues and, and programmatic issues and so forth. Uh, the district was also working to identify and implement a new learning management system, which uh, parents of the middle and high school know that to be called a Schoology, as, as well as students. And at the same time, the district is experiencing several new initiatives, changes and challenges. That's when the educator evaluation system was being implemented staff was getting used to a whole new technology platform to learn called TeachPoint. There's a new elementary math program complete with online components. We're implementing a one-to-one -one program and then we knew and we're anticipating the new technology standards coming out in the 2016-2017 school year. I'm almost done. Some of you may have seen this chart before but I share it simply uh, with the onset of the one-to-one -one implementation, the opening of the new school, all of the new things that I talked about that were going on at the same time, it's difficult to manage all of that change at once. And you can see along the top row of this chart, the researcher who produced this says, if you're going to, if you're going to manage the change effectively and actually realize sustained lasting change, then there are five steps that you need to make sure you take account. Uh, you have to have a vision, you have to provide the people who are going to implement the change, the level of skills, 
They have to be a certain level of incentives. You have to have the appropriate resources, and you have to have an action plan. And if you look down, for example, I'll just use the second. If, if, if the people who are implementing the action plan feel they don't have the skill sets necessary to be effective, this third column down, the skills are missing, then that produces a level of anxiety. If you don't have the resources, that produces a level of frustration. If all of these things are in place, then allegedly you have achieved successful change. But I share this simply because as a district, there was a, there was a, a mindset at the time that with, with regard to one-to-one -one in, in, in particular, that we need to put the resources in the hands of the teachers and the students and give them time to explore without putting too much demand and or too much accountability. Um, and there was also conversation at the building level to address the vision for technology integration, as well as an action plan for change. Those were building-based conversations, and we don't really have that district perspective. And I think Jeff's report will share a little bit, a little bit more about that. That we relied exclusive, uh, heavily on our subject supervisors and our building administrators to provide uh, the professional development for our instructional staff related to technology implementation. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that this is not necessarily a, lin a linear approach. You don't have to do visions first and or skill sets first and so forth, but you have to account for all five if you're going to affect change. So I share this simply because there was a lot going on in the last five years with regard to technology in the district. Just last school year, the new standards came out, and to date, the administrative, uh, there has been an administrative review of the new document and limited discussion at department and or grade level meetings. And next, uh, we're obviously as a district looking f forward to making use of the program review recommendations to integrate the new standards into practice. I think any one of the uh, educators who are sitting here in the room today, from Cheryl to Jim to Rita Marie and so forth, would say technology use in this district today is significantly different than it was five years ago. We are so much more advanced. Uh, the, there are pockets of innovation. There isn't a systemic agreement across the district. That's what we need to work on in the next next several years, o along with the standards. And how do, how do those standards get assigned? How are they implemented in various curricular programs? Because we don't have a separate technology class, so to speak. The technology standards are to be implemented in language arts and foreign language and social studies and so forth. So that's Dr. Klingerman's work when she comes on board. But having given you that little bit of a background and the community, more importantly, the background, I'd like to introduce Jeff Sun from Sun Associates in Chelmsford, Mass. And he was the lucky guy to have done the review for us here in Duxford. Welcome, Dr. Sun. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sun. Thanks. OK, so let's get set here. Um, you need uh, to I'll come up. Yep. Let go of the projector. second I think for my machine to come around and connect <coughs> so that showing up yep I got it now There we go. Okay. 
So thanks, Tim, for the um, introduction. This um, uh, basically uh, really helps. Uh, several of my slides might actually kind of duplicate some of the things that you were saying, so I'll try to, to speed through those. Um, I don't have a tremendous number of slides. Basically, what I want to do is just sort of frame um, at the beginning some of the, the process and, and uh, how we went about doing this work. And then uh, Paul's there, allow you to um, ask some questions if you have any, and then we can move into talking about basically what we found and uh, what we recommend. Now, I will also note that, um, at least for the board here um, uh, that's present, um, you've had a copy of the report. So, um, all of the details in there, and, and I mean, we're pleased to produce a lengthy report. I also tend, sometimes tend to apologize for the, the length of the report. It was, a, you know, 65 pages of fun-filled facts. So um, I can certainly understand uh, it might take a little while to digest and, and to go through. So hopefully that's the kind of thing that we can um, to frame and talk about here right now. So just some uh, uh, basic um, starting points. Uh, the uh, program review really was um, answering this, this primary question, which is about the extent to which um, Duxbury, and we're talking about students and teachers, um, the extent to which they're currently using digital learning technologies to support teaching and learning. So with that as the, the sort of big overarching question um, or uh, charge for the program review, um, we engage in a process um, and uh, members of the public, certainly some of the people here in the, the audience today, um, and including the um, school committee representation, was on a uh, committee of stakeholders, which is very central to our process, um, which really worked to, to guide the, uh, the whole program review process. And uh, this committee um, started off by working to define terms um, and areas of exploration. We frame this as talking about uh, developing indicators, and those indicators um, are things that are actually in the report. And basically they were indicators in three different categories that were looking to, to describe um, how digital learning could be used successfully to, um, to, to, and in very visual terms to support student learning, that was one. The other one was to support teacher skills um, and to, um, as to what teacher skills are required to effectively make use of digital learning in the classroom. And the third one is one that is probably very near and dear directly to the board's heart, which is um, how does the district need to um, uh, organize itself to best support the effective use of digital learning? And you really have to, to look at those as uh, three legs of a stool. And whenever we've done one of these program reviews, and we've done dozens and dozens of these things around the country, um, we may use slightly different terms, but essentially we're always looking at those three things because those are really the, the three primary components that um, would comprise any uh, digital learning program. So the end of all of this work, um, which, um, oh, actually, just to continue on with the process, the uh, committee developed the indicators that framed data collection. Um, we uh, went out and uh, we had the numbers in the report, but we conducted surveys and uh, did focus groups, did observations, um, and uh, interviewed every principal um, and did additional uh, interviews and discussions as we went around the district. And that constituted the data collection. You can see how um, so much of that data was um, uh, qualitative data that was really uh, built around discussions with people. And in the report, um, there's lots of these quotes that are um, basically form the structure of, of um, and the supports for what it is that we're talking about in terms of findings and recommendations. Um, and then ultimately we did develop findings and recommendations. Um, the committee um, uh, had an opportunity to review draft findings and recommendations before um, this turned into the report that you see. In fact, the committee actually looked at a much more condensed version of this um, and discussed it and provided input into um, the, the right way to frame things and actually um, uh, really through some of the process uh, kind of highlighted by the types of things that Tim was talking about before we started, filled in some of the back background. So no matter how thorough um, Sun Associates is in terms of looking at what happens um, in a district, we can't, you know, we're not magic. So we can't necessarily know what um, the background for everything. We don't know the full details for everything. We try to find out whenever we can. Um, but a lot of times um, um, it's that committee of stakeholders, once again, which can provide the history and the context and fill in the holes. So that's why we pre present back to the committee before creating the final report. 
Um, so all of that comes together into the report that you have, which basically does these three things. It, it assesses um, uh, the extent to which um, digital learning um, uh, that's happening in Duxbury's classrooms um, is aligned with the indicators, the indicators that we, three categories that we talked about. Um, it uh, really makes use of indicators that are aligned with standards-based best practices related to digital learning. Um, so once again, uh, the indicators were, were uh, crafted by the committee, facilitated by Sun Associates, but actually rooted in things like uh, national standards, and we'll talk a little bit more about standards in a moment here. Okay. Um, and first and foremost, I think, um, emphasizes the role of pedagogy. Um, as something that's required to um, support desired student outcomes. So um, the technology itself um, uh, certainly comes into play and technology is, is something that, you know, there's much to talk about here in Duxbury, but this at its heart is not a um, report that's about devices or networks or pieces of software or systems or something like that. This is about what teachers are doing in the classroom. And we hope and think that this actually has um, further applicability probably beyond just digital learning because um, a lot of the kinds of things we're talking about in terms of how teachers are supported, how teachers think about learning um, and think about pedagogy could in fact actually be used to inform any number of different initiatives um, and approaches to initiatives that the district may want to take in the future. So we hope that you get you know, a lot of mileage out of something like this. Um, now, one of the things that occurred to us as we were starting to, to pull all this together is um, that one way to analyze these findings or to, to talk about these findings um, that emphasizes the role of pedagogy in terms of supporting um, student skills is to look at a uh, framework for how teachers and students use digital learning um, within the instructional environment. Um, and there's a framework for doing that, and it turns out to be one that um, folks here in the district um, have some history with and have some familiar familiarity with. And this is something called um, the Substitution, Augmentation, Modification, Redefinition Framework. Um, fortunately, there's a snappy acronym for that, um, and uh, that acronym is something called SAMR. Um, and here is slightly different uh, version of a diagram that is also in your um, in the full text of the report and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through this but um, basically SAMR is four different levels um, uh, that are grouped into two big groups um, the lowest level of SAMR and it is a hierarchical model um, is the use of um, digital learning tools or technologies for substitution and then beyond that is augmentation. And th those are, are two ways of talking about using digital learning to basically enhance existing instructional um, environments. Um, and then moving beyond that is uh, reaching for something that um, people are always talking about, which is how does digital learning transform the instructional environment, okay? And the two teacher actions, um, pedagogical actions within um, transformation are this modification and redefinition. And once again, I won't go into great detail talking about what these things are because they're somewhat intuitive also. Um, but this is where teachers are really using digital learning um, and students are using digital learning to do things that um, go beyond simply um, uh, substituting for existing tools. One of the resources that the, um, was brought to the committee um, by uh, district folks um, and district folks to have a chance to look at on the committee was um, an article written by um, Alan November, uh, which was about um, something called moving beyond the um, $1,000 pencil. And that's um, uh, a fairly conventional way of talking about um, uh, technology being used essentially for substitution and augmentation. So, you know, the, uh, to put it another way, what is it that students or teachers, for that matter, are doing with one of these devices, you know, which in this case might be the $2,500 pencil, um, that gets them beyond um, essentially using a pencil, okay? You can have a bigger, fancier pencil, but are you simply, you know, just doing the same old stuff with the new things? Um, so that's why the indicators, to a large extent, are pushing at these transformation or higher levels. Now, another thing that we wanted to align this with, and this actually isn't in the report, but I think you'll see it makes sense, 
is a framework for looking at um, student skills. Okay, and uh, this is one that I think a lot of people in education are familiar with. It's Bloom's Taxonomy, which is basically taking um, student skills, once again, organizing them hierarchically, um, with the lowest level being essentially remembering things. And this, of course, is something I think that we're all familiar with from our, our school experiences where you basically have to memorize stuff. Um, I was sitting with my high school junior in the car this morning and he was talking about having to memorize these gigantic tables in his um, pre-calc class um, around sines and cosines and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, boy, I did that about 40 years ago. And that was one of those things that I forgot it the second I walked out of that AP test. Okay. Um, but there was probably some value at some point or another, or not, but they're still doing it 40 years later, um, to, to memorizing that stuff. And that's obviously a very low-level skill. And working our way up the, the pyramid there to um, evaluation and create um, creation skills. So to expedite this here, um, we can align something like Bloom's with something like SAMR. And you can see how um, basically the lower levels of Bloom's aligned with the, the substitution augmentation levels of, um, of SAMR. And as we move up SAMR, so we, we have these pedagogies that are really about transforming the instructional environment, that's the way that we can start to make a difference, we as educators, um, in reaching these higher order thinking skills and 21st century skills for students. Okay, So that's what we want. That's what we want to have happen. Not to say that you know there's not a value for remembering or memorizing um, or some of the lower level skills, but we want to build to the higher levels. Okay, And being able to support that is what digital learning sh truly should excel at and ultimately, I think, should be the vision for Duxbury students. All right. So um, just to, to recap the logic here, the um, two indicators, the student learning and the teacher skills indicators, really looked at the degree that digital learning is being used to support this um, transformative practices that we we're just talking about and higher level um, student outcomes. Okay? And the district supports indicator is about what the district needs to do to make that happen. So I'm going to pause here um, and just ask if there are any questions or, you know, does anybody want to sort of get more clarity on anything about the process or um, what data was collected or, or how we went about doing this? No? No, thank you. It seems okay. really clear. Okay, good. Well, that's how I like it. But. <laughs> All right. So, uh, moving on, what did we find? Okay. I think that it is um, obvious and, and very important to emphasize, and this builds on the stuff that Tim was talking about in the introduction, um, that Duxbury really has tremendous resources in terms of what we would broadly call infrastructure. Um, and it's not just the, the computers and the networks, but also the technical support. Um, you know, I, I almost hate bringing it up, but I always end up talking about it because school committees and public always wants to know, which is, you know, well, where do we stack up compared to other districts? And, you know, I, I anyway, I won't go into why that, that bothers me, but <laughs> the point is, is that, you know, guaranteed, as I'm traveling around and continuing to do this in other districts, I'm going to want people to take a look at what's happening in Duxbury. Okay, in terms of the, the way that you've set things up to be able to support digital learning, okay? So I think that that's, that's very, very important to, to emphasize. And, you know, Tim talked about the process that you went through several years ago in order to be able to put that stuff into place, okay? So that's terrific. Um, the uh, uh, infrastructure as it exists right now um, has, and once again, I'm not just talking about the stuff, but I'm talking about the way that the stuff is supported um, in terms of technical support and such. Um, uh, has really done a very good job, we think, of supporting practice at the augmentation and substitution levels of SAMR. Okay? So I can talk a little bit more about what that looks like in just a second. Um, but it's also clear that, and this is sort of the other kind of big chunk of findings, is that reaching these higher levels of SAMR, that is being able to, to get to the transformation level, is really going to require more work and a continued commitment to what we talk about here is a shared vision and common vocabulary. Okay, That's another way of saying something that um, Tim touched on, um, which is about these pockets of excellence. 
okay, pockets of innovation. Um, there are pockets of innovation that are out there right now. Um, clearly the role though, or the, the, the task at hand, is to be able to expand and build upon those things, okay? And um, uh, it's, not, it's not easy to build on that. Um, um, and a lot of it has to do with leadership, and leadership has a lot to do with establishing that vision and that common vocabulary, okay? Um, uh, there's not at all consensus across the district that um, um, around a variety of terms, and, and the report goes into much greater detail about this as to what does project-based learning mean? What does inquiry mean? Um, is inquiry desirable? Um, what's actually happening with the technology in one classroom versus another, okay? Um, uh, that's not necessarily a horrible thing or, you know, it's like, oh my God, what's going on? How come people don't know this kind of thing? But it is what it is. And in order to be able to, to build on that, um, that's the, you know, the, the work of making uh, digital learning systemic, which I think is, is a common goal in a lot of districts. So um, uh, that's the little SAMR diagram, which is probably very difficult to see, but you know what it says by now, on the left side of the screen. So just to talk about some of the specifics, um, and I can give much more detail, you know, if you're interested in it, it's once again, it's in the report. Um, uh, about what we saw in terms of enhancement, clearly things like word processing, I mean, that's happening. You're not using the, you know, the, the five cent pencil anymore, you're definitely using the thousand dollar pencil. Um, there um, is, is use of technology for that, presentation making, um, that's, that's just happening everywhere here. Um, and uh, Googling replacing encyclopedias, okay. Um, uh, you know, I saw the, the big set of encyclopedias <laughs> on the bookshelves in the uh, um, central office. Um, it's, it's interesting that people actually kept those things. Um, they'd probably be Not worth something. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which, <laughs> 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 Jeff, can I stop for a minute? Yeah. Because that, that to me speaks more middle school, high school, not the elementary, which you might be getting into, but there was a clear difference in the responses from staff and, you know, word processing. There were so many comments saying the kids don't know how to type. Yeah, there were a lot of comments saying the kids don't know how to type, but on the other hand, there were a lot of comments about, you know, kids are doing, um, and not just comments, but evidence, the kids are doing, you know, uh, developmentally and physically appropriate things with technology at a particular grade level. Um, you know, uh, put another way, second graders are doing their version of Googling the information. Second graders are not, despite the fact that some parents actually believe this is the case, um, are not actually just freely going out on the internet and, and doing searches. But, you know, there's a uh, very well constructed um, process that the elementary teachers have for going off and identifying resources for kids. Um, they have a, a safe search ability that they can guide kids to at, at the lower grade levels in elementary school. And there's also the use of these OCR um, things, which I think any elementary parent is, is familiar with um, um, because it, they seem to be very, very commonly used here in schools. And this is something I haven't seen necessarily used in a lot of other places. Um, What's OCR? OCR, um, optical character recognition. They're like, um, oh, you know, the, you see them. There's, QR codes. QR codes, right. Do you know the square oh, things yeah. that look like a yeah, bark? That, yeah, that's what I mean is QR codes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so uh, I went into a number of different classes where, you know, there's a, a wall, the teacher has printed out a whole bunch of QR codes and, and kids go and, they, you know, they take their iPad and they show it at the QR code and that brings them to a particular website that the teacher wants them to go to or a resource or a story or something like that, you know. So that's, th those kinds of things are inactive use in the elementary schools. There is a whole, and I, I don't mean to, to kind of go down a different rabbit hole here right now, but um, we'll, we'll spend a little more time in that rabbit hole in a second when we talk about um, digital literacy and, and media literacy. Um, there's an argument um, or an active discussion um, that's happening at the elementary level around um, whether it is appropriate that kids actually be screened and contained as much as they are. 
Um, you know, I think that there's as many people who say, you know, thank goodness our kids can't go out there and, you know, find all this horrible stuff on the Internet. And then there's, you know, I have quotes from parents who are saying, you know, well, one of the reasons why kids don't know how to do anything is because, you know, they're so well protected. And, I mean, this is a little bit like the NPR stories about um, the playgrounds where kids can get hurt. Um, you know, do we like the playgrounds where kids can get hurt or do we like the playgrounds that are padded? You know, so that's, you know, that kind of uh, discussion exists whether we're talking about technology or we're talking about monkey bars. Um, but to keep moving here, um, uh, there's, there's clearly a lot of use of technology for, um, for at the enhancement level. Um, a lot of the work that is happening within um, things like Schoology at the secondary level still fits in enhancement. It doesn't have to. There could be things that are done with Schoology um, that move you more towards transformation. But basically, Schoology is a you know, very fancy electronic filing cabinet and communication system and way for people to talk to each other. And these kinds of things happened before there was Schoology. I'm not saying that they should be done without a learning management system, and I think that once again, Duxbury gets you know kudos for having put something like that into place at the secondary level, and for that matter, a lot of elementary people are are looking towards wanting to do something like that now as well. Um, but it's not transformational. Okay. Now, what did we see that gets more into the transformation side of things? Um, um, what would we be looking for? Looking for using information um, and uh, um, having access to technology that really alters the, the orientation of the learning process. Um, that is stuff that we're talking about around um, shifting um, the, the, and flipping classrooms. And flipping is a term that's uh, gained currency recently. Um, but basically, a particular, I guess, for the, the home audience. Um, that's talking about um, uh, uh, using the classroom time more for um, individual attention between teacher and student um, and uh, uh, discussion, collaboration, collaboration student to student, student to teacher, um, and taking out of the classroom a lot of the kind of um, just sitting there and reading or um, looking at resources or doing some of the kind of rote stuff um, that um, sort of has traditionally been associated with, with classroom time. So when you think about, you know, all of the, the learning that needs to occur in order for kids to be able to, to acquire these, these uh, 21st century skills and, and work in a 21st century kind of way, um, uh, managing the time in the classroom um, becomes significant. And um, you, you can't create more hours in the day or more hours in the classroom. So you figure out what doesn't actually have to happen in the classroom and what does have to happen in the classroom. Um, and uh, technology can be used very effectively for that. And that's where something like um, a learning management system can actually come into play and be significant because the learning management system allows the teacher to, to electronically structure the content of the course and have kids be able to access this stuff outside of the classroom. Okay. If they're sitting in the classroom using the learning management system to access the resources while they're in the classroom, that probably isn't the most effective way to use this. Okay. Um, students driven, student centered learning um, and um, <coughs> examples of that kind of thing um, are more project based learning, um, STEM activities. Um, and this is where I can also talk about elementary classrooms. Um, we do actually see um, as some good examples, and we talk about them in the report, of you know, real project based learning happening in some of the elementary. Um, classrooms, okay? And what we're talking about there is hands-on work that involves a lot of student choice that's organized and um, connects to very broad essential questions. Um, and that moves the idea of project-based learning a little bit farther away than just sort of projects. And there's a lot of projects right now, and this goes to some of this discussion about common vocabulary. Um, you could say, well, you know, do you do project-based learning? Oh, yeah, we have projects, okay? But do we have projects in the sense of real inquiry project-based learning, okay? And we do see some of that. You have a terrific example of somebody in, um, um, I 
this in Halton, um, who is, uh, you probably know about this, um, having kids build boats and build boats out of um, materials that they then have to like go get in the pool and their, their boats can't sink because I guess this is somehow associated with the swimming course that kids have to do or something like that. I was sort of blown away when I heard about that because I'm thinking it's like, you know, oh my God, the liability of, you know, putting kids in a pool with things made out of duct tape. Um, but, it's hey, end. what's that? <laughs> it's the shallow end. Well, regardless, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, that happens, and that's a, you know, that's a terrific project. And we heard other teachers say, oh, I've heard about what he's doing, and you know, I'd like to do kind of something like this. We heard support at the administrative level for more of that kind of thing happening. It'd be great to grow that. I'm not saying every kid, you know, maybe somebody else can make gliders and they can you know, <laughs> jump off of buildings or something, but um, I'm not suggesting that, that all projects have to be quite that you know, interactive, but um, that's a terrific example of STEM. Um, it, clearly the kids are into it um, and it leverages technology as a resource but kids are actually out there building things with their hands okay so that's a, a terrific way of, of bringing this stuff together um, I could have more examples but I think that you know you, you, you see them in the report um, the point is is that um, things are happening at the enhancement level lots of it, um, transformation, we're dealing with the pockets of, of excellence. So in order to do more transformation, um, what does this require? Okay, um, it requires this commonly held vision that we talked about, and it's commonly held vision for what this transformation looks like. And I wanna emphasize the commonly held part because you know, a vision, if everybody's got their own vision, that is not particularly helpful. Okay, so there needs to be, you know, something that the community buys into and, and comes together on um, saying, okay, this is what we want, bless you, um, learning to look like in our classrooms, okay? It also requires skills on the part of students and teachers necessary to, to work and learn in this transformed environment. Okay, so this starts to get to um, something that comes up quite often um, uh, in the report, which is um, uh, students' digital literacy skills and um, uh, uh, media literacy skills. There was a lot of talk at the high school level about um, kids using technology to cheat um, and uh, um, uh, basically not having good digital citizenship skills. Um, I'm a little mixed as to whether I think that this is as big and pressing a problem as it seems sometimes um, to be stated to be, but um, I do think that it's very clear that there's not, and Tim pointed this out, you know, there's not a um, coordinated uh, digital learning curriculum um, or digital literacy curriculum here in the district right now. So, you know, some kids just get this. Some kids manage to have the right kinds of experiences through, you know, kind of, you know, weaving their way through um, the right teachers such that, you know, they've, you know, they've developed this and some kids have it. Okay. Um, so, you know, clearly that's just a little more happenstance than, than you need. You need to have a much more formalized um, scope and sequence for this kind of thing or plan for developing these skills and providing the resources. Um, that support implementing this vision. So a little more specificity, um, uh, just talked about uh, digital media literacy skills, um, a standards aligned scope and sequence, and I just want to, let's see if this is letting me do it, yep. Um, uh, talk a little bit more about standards. Tim was talking about the state um, so-called uh, DC or D, LCS standards, which is the Digital Literacy Computer Science <coughs> Standards. Um, there's another set of standards that is not my dog. Um, that is my dog, but the, that has, my dog has nothing to do with standards. Um, the, that we took a look at um, when uh, talking about uh, developing the, the indicators, and these are the ISTE NETS S standards. Um, one of the things I was thinking about in relation to this, um, and this is all referenced in the, the hard copy of the report, 
But one of the things I was thinking about is Tim was talking about how uh, three or four years ago um, there there was work around mapping to the uh, um, technology stand state technology standards. One of the things that's happened in the last four or five years nationally, and this is the kind of thing that we try to bring into you know this sort of review, is that there has been a a decided move moving away from standards that are very much about, you know, this is what you do with a computer. Um, I mean, I remember when I first started doing this kind of stuff, and um, uh, there was ISTE net standards back then, too. And ISTE net standards um, gave rise to something that you used to see in computer labs. First off, you used to see computer labs. Um, and then you used to see these on posters on the walls of computer labs all over um, the country, which were these, like, uh, big diagrams showing, you know, this is the computer, this is the hard drive, this is the monitor, this is the floppy disk drive. And that was something that, you know, standards expected that kids would be taught, okay? We've moved away from that to things that are, uh, this is the most current iteration of ISTE NETS, which is uh, standards for students. Um, and these just came out um, two years ago, okay? And here the categories are things like empowered learner, digital citizen, knowledge constructor. And you can see um, these are describing students who have, I always talk about dispositions, but the skills and dispositions that are aligned with those higher order skills, okay? The upper levels of blooms, if you can think back to that, okay? So to some extent, we're, we're taking for granted, although I realize that we could come back to this too, you know, that uh, kids, know the parts of a computer. And we're now talking about more, well, what is it that kids would actually do with technology, okay? Learning the parts of the computer is actually something that, you know, to the extent that they need to know how to turn it on or something like that, is something that kids, in fact, actually do know. You know, and there's a lot of, of misconceptions out there around, you know, well, students are, you know, they're digital, they're digital natives, they already know how to do all this stuff. Well, yeah, they know how to, like, you know, flip through screens faster than, you know, than, humans like us can perceive, um, and uh, they know how to turn it on, they know how to do all sorts of, you know, connecting to things, but they don't necessarily know how to use that technology to be a knowledge constructor, or a creative communicator, or a global collaborator, okay? So these are the kinds of standards that um, um, the district's indicators are aligned with, and ultimately should feed into this vision that we're talking about. So let me go back to, and I promise you we are just about done with the slides too. If, um, one of the things to make that happen is uh, more pedagogical, instructional support to teachers this is something that teachers are asking for. Once again, it doesn't um, deny the fact that there is um, the, the subject supervisors have done a terrific job of supporting teachers right now. But it's not enough. You know, to some extent you are, you know, I hate to put it this way because it's not a good way to put it, but you're kind of victims of your own success. Um, as you have, you know, more technology out there and more attention to it, and everybody knows that this is a fabulous resource that, you know, really needs to be maximized, people want to use it. Teachers want to know, what else can I do with this? Okay, is this all there is? Um, I heard that somebody else could do something. I'd like to be able to do that thing. I talked to somebody in another district, and they can do things that I can't do. Okay, or I went to some conference, and you know I learned about this stuff. That places a tremendous demand on instructional support. So one of the things that we recommend is that ultimately um, the district uh, work towards bringing on digital learning coaches. Okay. Um, I can, I can talk more about that later if, if there's interest in that, okay? Um, and teacher professional development that focuses on um, pedagogy and integration. And this is probably a, a one last place, and this is actually the last slide, um, to, to put that plug in for the common vocabulary, okay? Because um, uh, one of the things that I found curious when I was first going through the data 
is we ask teachers, you know, do you feel that you have uh, adequate professional development? And, uh, you know, so we get certain results in a survey. We also, um, you know, spoke to them in focus groups and, and got their text comments in the survey and stuff like that. And curiously enough, people were saying, oh, I, we, we have plenty of professional development. You know, I don't think I need any more professional development. Okay. But then we were asking teachers, you know, further when we're talking to them, you know, so how do you get, you know, more support? How do you get, you know, how do you learn how to do these things instructionally? And they're like, well, I don't know. There's, you know, nobody's actually helping us with that, which isn't exactly true. But um, the, the point is, is that they're asking for something that I think is professional development, but they don't necessarily call it professional development because in a lot of their minds, professional development is the class on how do you turn the smart board on or how do you turn on the Apple TV or, you know, how do you um, uh, use Schoology, okay? And that's necessary, but that's relatively straightforward stuff. So as you dig a little bit farther into it, then they start talking about, they being the teachers, um, talk about wanting to have um, um, uh, diversified or level professional development. So what they're asking for there is what we're really talking about, which is, you know, okay, so once you know how to turn the thing on, you know, wh what's the, you know, 200 level course versus the 100 level course in using the technology? Okay, well, they need to have more of that. But the important point there, or the point I was trying to make, is you can't get too hung up on the terms. Um, because, in fact, actually, you know, people may say they're getting enough professional development, but what they're really asking for is something that they don't know is called professional development. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff happening, okay? There's a lot of, of need for more discussion and, uh, uh, you know, essentially people getting their heads together around what they're trying to do. So that was the, the quick believe it or not, um, <laughs> tore through uh, um, what was actually a very large project um, with a whole lot of information. Um, I'm, you know, like to hear if there's anything else that you guys want to know or um, ask me what you want. Do you have any questions? Mine are always more comments, I think. But do you want to go first? Or? I don't mind. Um, I was just wondering if if your impression is that the pockets of excellence where you see higher levels of mm -hmm. pedagogy that are transformative, whether that actually translates to higher quality of learning. So higher quality of teaching, but my question is how do we link that, how does the school district link that to a higher quality of learning? Well, you have to define learning. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, so this goes back to, to um, that thing that lines SAMR up with uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, you know, if you are attempting to, to have students, you know, engage with and develop, you know, these, these higher order skills, you know, to, to learn how to do these things, then you need to teach in ways that support that kind of stuff. You know, one of the things that I guess is sort of implicit in your question is, you know, um, are we going to get better MCAS scores if we, now I'm not, I don't, I, yeah. I hate to bring that up, but the, the point is, is that you have to be able to find a way to, to measure learning. Yeah. And um, it, I'm not going to say that, you know, that anybody has a really good handle on being able to measure learning that happens at these higher levels. I think most yeah. teachers can tell you when they see it. Well, the, I, th I understand what you're saying, but um, Bloom's taxonomy was developed before computers. So there were people exhibiting those patterns of thought or patterns of um, learning prior to the onset of technology in schools. So, you know, from a school committee point of view, and I am not a techno skeptic, so uh, I, there's no kind of underlying animosity in this question. It's more um, trying to identify as we, um, as we inspire or encourage our teachers to adopt more transformative patterns of pedagogy, what should we be looking for in terms of learning, uh, its impact on learning? Um, because it seems like we're encouraging teachers to 
to change mm -hmm. uh, without a clear concept of what the learning outcomes are going to be that, that are any different than they might have been prior to having the technology. Well, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does make sense. And, and you raise a, a, a number of interesting points there, including one that um, I often make. Um, I don't know if I've made it for this group, but um, yeah, as much as I talk about 21st century skills, um, I also tend to be a little dismissive of 21st century skills. And my, my academic background is in history, um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about history in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, 21st century skills are like second century skills. You know, I don't see why the 21st century feels that we have some sort of, like, you know, ownership <laughs> on creativity, collaboration, communication, um, and what the other one is. Um, critical thinking. Yeah. I mean, you know, in order to be successful um, for essentially, you know, as long as human history has existed, you know, successful people are able to think critically. Mm. You know, we may think critically now about, you know, the human genome and, and genetic engineering. You know, at one point they were thinking critically around, you know, well, if, if we carve this thing that's square out of stone, we probably won't be able to put it on the cart and make it roll um, very well. So, you know, the point is, is that the skills that we're shooting for, I think, are, are eternal skills. Um, but I think the important thing is to, to shoot for the skills more than, you know, the, the very specific content knowledge. Right. Content knowledge is, is necessary. The only other thing that I wanted to say, and I'm sorry this may be a little distracted, is, you know, if you look at the indicator that the district came up for for student learning, I think that 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 is a way of saying, you know, well, boy, if we're able to to do these things that are in the indicator, whether or not we use digital learning, then we will in fact actually be teaching our students to do something. Right that we feel is important. So what are those things? I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but students analyze, synthesize, and communicate their ideas. Demonstrate critical and innovative thinking through individual and collaborative authentic learning activities. Now, you know, I'm looking, because I'm the digital learning evaluator, mm -hmm. for ways that people are using digital learning technology to support that, okay? Um, but I totally agree with you that you know, one could find examples of those kinds of things happening that don't necessarily involve digital learning. Right. Okay. So I think that's the kind of, of, of student outcomes that you're shooting for. And implicit in all of this, you know, in the next paragraph, students take ownership of their learning. Okay? So that is something that you can see happening in a classroom in a different kind of way than a classroom that is a student stand or a teacher standing up and essentially lecturing and telling all the kids to do the same thing. You know, that's a very, very crass and shorthanded way of putting it. But, you know, a, a classroom where students take ownership of their learning and demonstrate, bada bada bum, you know, is a very different kind of classroom than one that is organized essentially around the teacher. Sure. Okay. So, Thank you hope that much. helps. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm more of a technophobe than Julia. <laughs> um, I don't like to see technology for the use of technology. And, and this, it's an interesting discussion because I think we do see a lot of higher order skills in the kids that aren't necessarily driven by digital computer usage. Um, and when I look at that, the ISTE standards, it's almost a little frightening from the perspective of using technology because we are making um, mini adults, like it's an episode of The Office and they're supposed to use something to produce this project-based learning outcome with technology and perhaps, you know, back in the day when they were just trying to analyze Play-Doh and could put together a really nice, I don't know, paper or poster board, it, it sort of, so I feel like right now we're really caught in the crossroads of how, how much is this helping and how much is it, um, and I don't know, you can't answer those questions, how much is it um, straining the teachers or the students or how, you know, but some kids are going to embrace it and get to those higher skills and what's the responsibility of the teachers to do that. Um, and, and there were a couple of quotes that just really jumped out at me because I did read most of the 65-page report um, a couple times. Um, 
And one of the quotes was, students interpret inquiry as being a bad teacher. They expect you cannot teach and just throw it at them. So I thought that was really interesting. That's the student perception when you go into it. That's a teacher's perception of what students say. Right. That the students are thinking that you're a bad teacher. And, and my opinion is inquiry-based is actually hard. You actually have to be a much more talented teacher because to, to truly be inquiry-based, you have to give your students a lot of leeway, mm -hmm. which you know. And then um, another quote was, I have students who would literally fail instead of asking a question, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I guess in that case, the technology would be better for that student because they can just sit there. However, I think that was sort of linked to they only want to find the right answer. Yeah, and, and, and that social studies, you know, so, social studies classes don't have the state testing, so it's okay to, for them mm -hmm. to be a little more free with it. But the other classes where the kids know they have to take MCAS, they just want the right answer. So it's sort of a hindrance. Right. Well, I actually, um, th both of those comments, I think, were in there in a way to, to illustrate um, things that shouldn't be happening. So basically, you know, my reading of that is to the extent that those things are, are accurate assessments of, you know, student attitudes as reflected <coughs> by their teachers. Um, that points to the fact that, that, that these students that have these attitudes need to be challenged to, to take more risks, to come out of their shell, to be more, you know, um, self-directed, um, to uh, greater owners of their learning. Now, that's not necessarily a um, uh, something that can happen solely through the use of technology. I wouldn't right. believe that to be the case. Um, I think that that technology can be used to inspire some students to do more of that. But you know, more important is you know, kind of setting the the expectation that students will take ownership of their learning. You know, regardless of the mechanism for that learning transpiring. Okay, and what I believe that those teachers were pointing out is that in the first case that it's, it's, it's challenging a lot of times to, to put students into an environment where um, uh, you're putting more of the burden of learning back on the kids. You know? and, and you know, frankly, I understand that. I think one of my notes to myself when I was uh, reading that one is like, you know, this guy sounds like he must be teaching, I don't know if it was a guy or a woman, but teaching my kid. Because actually I have one kid who, um, brief story, I have two kids, but one of the kids, this is what the story's about. I remember when he started at um, uh, my district's high school, and I think he was in um, ninth grade, and uh, his science teacher um, was all about um, uh, student-centered learning and collaborative learning, and she used Scrum to um, have the kids work together in small groups, and you know they were you know investigating the, the curriculum themselves and kind of moving themselves through units independently, and all, and she was doing a minimum of standing up and lecturing. Okay, and this guy had just come, my kid had just come from um, you know eight years where he was being lectured to the entire time. Okay, and. Um, and his attitude was, you know, this teacher is lazy. She doesn't want to do any of the work that a teacher is supposed to do. She's like putting it all back on us. You know, she's not doing her job. And it, it killed me to hear that because, you know, it's like, this is my kid. You know, he's talking about this. I'm running around like, you know, challenging teachers to actually become more like, <laughs> you know, his science teacher. And he's telling me that, you know, I'm committing some crime against, you know, ninth graders. But, um, it's a very common thing, okay? And, you know, it's interesting. I talk to teachers all the time, you know, in my district who say that, you know, this is our biggest challenge. You know, kids just want to be handed the information. They want to be told what the right answer is and, you know, how to, to respond and move ahead. So you've got that happening here, too. Um, and challenging kids to get beyond that is, is the job of the teacher. Right. All right, and then my only other comments were um, budgetary. <laughs> Clearly, we need a digital literacy, some, some sort of class or something in the curriculum, and, um, you know, IT staff to help IT point people would be my, on my wish list, which we didn't get this year. The, co yeah, the, the coaches, yeah. We had coaches in our budget for this year, but we, we didn't get anything. Right. 
extra. We didn't get any wish list items in our budget. Yeah, I understand. So we'll fight for that for next year. <laughs> right. But that would be very beneficial, right. seemingly. I mean, that was pretty loud and clear. I, I think that, that you know this, um, but, you know, also I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, it, it's very clear that the, the one of the things that Duxbury has very much going for it is a really strong IT department. Yes. You know, the, the IT folks are, <laughs> you know, really doing a great job and are, are very well respected. But, you know, one of the things, and I don't know that I wrote it exactly this way in the report, but one of the things that the IT people were talking to me about when I was talking to them is that, you know, a large percentage of the, the tickets that get passed on to the help desk are actually for instructional support. So, you know, they're actually, teachers are asking them about instructional issues and they can't support it it's not it's just not in their knowledge base and that doesn't make them bad IT people but it just means that you know uh, there is a role out there that is currently unfilled so hopefully you will get those positions at some point yeah great okay. Okay. Sure. Fifty-nine. <laughs> this report similar to any other curricular re review really will serve as the roadmap for moving forward. There are lots of good recommendations, lots of good suggestions. We'll have to, uh, we and or you, will have to wrestle with the directions. Uh, there will be some real critical questions to be discussed and you know, what is the ultimate goal that we want students to be able to know and do with regard to the use of technology? And what is that vision? Um, and, and that's work that's still yet to be done, but that's exciting work. And that's um, the result of this report itself. You know, the, the irony is not lost on me that the newest among us, you know, new to the district, uh, a consultant to the district, are sitting here talking about the history of the district when the history of the district is sitting mm -hmm. out here. <laughs> and they, they have the knowledge, the skill sets, and the expertise to move us forward. So I, I really want to acknowledge all of the people who are sitting here who have been working in the Duxbury Public Schools during this time frame, they, they are um, the ones who are going to pick up the mantle and lead us forward. Um, and just naming specifically, um, you know, I've worked in four or five different districts now in 35 years of education, and I've not met a, a technology director who is as skilled and informed as what you have in Cheryl. So I'm, I'm very appreciative and thankful for um, what she's done and will continue to do, I'm sure, as we look at this report and, and move forward. No pressure, Cheryl, but just get it done. <laughs> <laughs> but Jeff, thank you. Sure. Can, just yeah. can, I, can I say one thing? The, um, thanks, Jeff. I really, yeah. really comprehensive and, and it's, it's great work. And I just want to say, like, none of this really surprises me. And I, I've actually been talking about this as far back as my interviews when I, when I came here. And, I don't know if you'll agree or disagree, just so if you disagree, don't, don't say anything. But, <laughs> you know, Duxbury is not unique, I guess, in the position we're in, where a lot of districts um, like Duxbury have the opportunity to infuse a lot of technology in, into its schools for whatever reason, mm -hmm. whether it's like budgetary timing or a building project or whatever it may be. Um, and that was, that, that happens. And then you kind of then deal with the, the pedagogical and instructional stuff simultaneously and then, and then later. Some districts do a longer ramp up and focus on the instructional and pedagogical stuff for us and then de decide on a device. But I don't find anything surprising where we are. I think, and I'm really proud of actually what, what we're doing here in Duxbury. And I think we're very well positioned. I, you know, I had the chance over the course of the last decade or so to visit a lot of schools, you know, some throughout the country actually, who are supposed to be you know, the most innovative as well as technology in the country. And I, I tell you that because there's this several of these schools around the country that receive visitors from all over the country constantly to the point where they actually have to you know, schedule them. And I say that because there's only a few of those, right? There's really only a few of those who have really figured it out. And they tend to be specialized schools, tiny little charters, whatever it may be. Most people like Duxbury, like wrestling with what to do in this new, you know, in this new age. So. I don't know, I just put that out there and say, like, I think we're in really great shape. I think we have a ton of work to do, but uh, we have such a solid foundation, I think that, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to thrive. And, I don't know, just yep. for, for what it's worth. Yep. I
agree with that. It would, it would be also nice to have the students who really can, who have that ability. Some kids just are better at integrating technology and doing the higher level things. <coughs> so to have, harness that and see how they can uh, help their peers, because that in itself would be <laughs> a project. Mm -hmm. And there, there are actually a number of programs, um, model programs, and, and you know, I'm glad to follow up with any more information that you, know, you guys would be interested in um, that, uh, about how you leverage students themselves to do exactly what you're talking about. Right. I think that it's, it's, it's still very important, you know, always though to emphasize that, you know, to go back to that district support indicator that, you know, the district has certain um, um, things that it needs to do in order to provide the, the basis and the backbone. Uh, but building off of that, there's, there's lots of work that could be done with things like students. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Is that? Okay. Let's give that one a minute. All right. Um, what's happened to my Wi Fi connection? Getting the airplay signal. Do you want me to bring it to you? so I won't even bring it up. So. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Do we, are we doing the scholarship? No, it's not. It's not. Oh, in case. Uh, yeah, sure you do. <coughs> okay. So, oh my gosh. <coughs> okay. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. I'm just, how do I get it to do full so screen? Down, so go. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So Julia Adams is presenting on Duxbury's education spending um, in context to yeah. a lot so, of things. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I started off um, this, it turned into a project, but originally I started off with our, uh, where we ended our last meeting, which was to try to understand, Peter had asked us to um, try to understand whether we wanted incremental increases in uh, the school operating budget or whether we wanted a kind of step change in the school operating budget. And I felt like I couldn't really answer that question until I understood a bit about um, where, uh, where our education spending patterns um, kind of fit into the bigger picture of uh, towns that support top school districts in Massachusetts. And, and so um, the question I, uh, I wanted to, to investigate was how do we move beyond this kind of having a level services budget or less every year and try and fund some of the improvements such as the um, technology coaches that Dr. Antonucci was talking about. So. Uh, and the first thing was to try and understand what the scale of change in our budget uh, would be needed to fund these types of improvements. So I took our, um, our, the superintendent's recommended budget for fiscal 19, and all those items, including the instructional coaches, added up to $747,000 above level services. So that's, that's the cost of one year's school improvement. 
Uh, and that amount uh, roughly equals 1% of general fund revenue in Duxbury. Uh, and so it's an incremental change, but a relatively small number like that could have a big impact. So why am I talking about general fund revenue? Well, Duxbury's public schools, like the other departments in town, are funded by general fund revenue, which is derived from the property tax levy and local receipts, such as excise tax and uh, beach stickers and things like that. Um, state and federal aid, so Chapter 70 funds, which are the foundation, um, foundation budget and various entitlement grants. And then revolving funds, so kindergarten tuition, preschool tuition, bus fees. So Duxbury's um, public schools have three sources of funding. The 86.1% uh, of education spending in Duxbury is drawn from general fund revenue. And you can see the pie chart on the right shows the breakdown of the town's general fund revenue, and 74% of it comes from property taxes, 14% from local receipts, and then state and federal aid, 8%, and other revenue, 4%. So I wanted to, that made me want to know a little bit more about our property taxes uh, and how they compared with other um, towns that support top performing schools. So I looked first at um, Duxbury's revenue base. Uh, where does, uh, what's our real estate tax ba base look like? What's our tax rate? What's the average family's tax burden? And then uh, I looked at Duxbury's revenue allocation. What does it do with the money uh, that it, it receives in its general fund? And I used, I was able to use the information that's available from the Department of Revenue website. So I defined top performing school districts as the top 50 school districts listed in Boston <coughs> Magazine's best public school districts in Boston for 2017. Um, and I should note that uh, they're, t they're top 50 school districts, but some of them are regional school districts, so it actually includes a total of 64 municipalities that, are, that I looked at. And all the municipal financial data comes from one of these two web pages. One is the um, Division of Local Services Municipal Finance. Oops. Muni what's happened? Uh oh. Um, no. Sorry. Says AirPlay is on. Alden went out for it. You could end Alden went out for it? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what's happened. <laughs> she is the expert. So. Sorry, folks. What do you usually put on? Duxbury Visitor. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, kicked out. Got it. Julie, I can just play for you if you want. Could you? I got a 10 match. Okay. You have it? I yeah. have it up on my screen. I just thought to make sure. I just got it. Okay. Great. And now Cheryl has it. I have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shannon, I'll see if you have it. <laughs> Wait, so. Technology's grand when it works. Right. Exactly. It just, she just lost Wi Fi. Great. Okay. Thank you.
Okay. So, um, so these are the two web pages I use, the Municipal Finance Trend Dashboard, and then there's a Revenue and Expenditure Reports from Schedule A. So this is all information based on information that towns submit to the Department of Revenue on an annual basis. So none of it's my data, just as you know. Um, so the revenue base, uh, Duxbury is a predominantly residential town. So um, tax, uh, tax rates are, are Tax bills are based on the class of property. So there's residential, open space, uh, commercial, and industrial property. And Duxbury has 95.8% of its property base is either residential or open space. And looking at the 64 towns that support top performing schools, the median there is 89.9%. So you could argue that Duxbury is more rural or uh, more residential um, than some of the other school districts against which we're comparing it. So then I looked at our tax rate. Our tax rate um, for fiscal year 2017 was $15.51 per thousand. The median for the 64 municipalities was $15.32. Um, but you'll see that our fiscal year down at the bottom, fiscal year 2018, tax rate is $15.16. So our ta it's not our tax rate that's at issue here. That seems to be fairly in line with the group that, of towns we're talking about. But the property tax burden is um, what you get when you multiply the tax rate uh, uh, with the assessed value of the property. So what this chart uh, aims to show is that Duxbury's single family tax burden is a bit high um, compared to this group of towns. Uh, and that must be because our assessed values are higher on average than the towns in this group. So then I looked, that was where the money comes from. Um, these next few slides are, are try to address where the money goes to. Um, so in, as Peter's presentation at town meeting showed um, Duxbury spent 45.85% of its general fund revenue on education in fiscal year 2016. And that includes all education spending, both by the district and the town, with the exception of debt service related to any of the school buildings. So it does include um, uh, uh, health insurance and pension expenditures, um, transportation, out of district spending, it includes everything. So Duxbury's ratio was 45.85%. The median for the group of top 50 school districts is 51.26%. So relative to that group, Duxbury is under allocating to education. And then I looked, at, we, having mentioned that Duxbury is predominantly residential, I looked at just those towns which had um, more than 90% of their tax base as residential or open space. And compared, that, that was 32 towns out of the total 64. And what we find is that those towns actually spend a larger proportion of their revenue on education than the, all the towns uh, together. Um, and so Duxbury is again kind of um, uh, under allocating to its schools compared to what you would call similar towns supporting similarly top performing schools. And so looking back over time, I wanted to understand well, it, it's, it, it's this year different than prior years. And it kind of is if you look back over the previous decade. Um, fiscal year 2017 allocation is l the lowest of any uh, in the past 10 years. Um, and we were allocating somewhere, you know, prior to fiscal year 2013, we were allocating somewhere between 48 and 50 percent of our general fund revenue to education. Which begs the question, well, why? And we can discuss that in a minute. But I wanted to just play a scenario. Well, what would happen if Duxbury were to allocate its general fund revenue to education at the median level for all the top 50 school districts? 
or just the very residential towns um, that support school, top performing school districts. So A is the median allocation for all top 50 school districts, 51.26% of general revenue. That would add up to $4.1 million increase in our uh, operating budget or in education spending town-wide. Um, and B, compared to just predominantly residential towns, if we spend at that median, which is higher, that would um, call for an increase of five and a half million dollars in education spending across the town. So the conclusion I came to here was that just a small change in the allocation of revenue um, would have a big impact on our schools. And so going back to why we might be at a relatively low allocation of spending to revenue, um, I looked at how Duxbury spends its money over the past decade. And what you can see is that in fis between fiscal year 2013 and 2014, there was an increase in debt service costs related to bonds issued to pay for the police station, the fire station, and the school buildings. So the high school, middle school, and the field house. And that has um, been offset by a relative decrease in funding for education and, to a lesser extent, public safety. So that's policemen and firemen. Uh, but I put in this last slide because the Proposition 2 and a half enables towns that incur um, large capital expenditures to offset the debt service costs of those capital expenditures by taxing above what would have been the normal levy limit. Um, and that's called a debt exclusion. So what I tried to show here was that um, the town has, has the ability to um, to cover all of the long-term debt service costs associated with building projects like the school by additional tax levy. So we shouldn't really have a situation in which um, investments in our school buildings or a police station or a fire station are somehow cutting into operating funds available for those departments um, in theory. In practice, there are probably nuances to this that I don't fully understand. But I think it's a question to, to perhaps bring to our um, municipal finance discussion uh, later in the year um, as to how, how, what the dynamics are here and what possibilities they are, there are for changing the way we're funding our schools. So that's, that's it. Yeah. It's great. We've talked about this. this is, this is, every time I look at it, it's really incredible work. Oh, thank you. I, enjoy it. I was talking to it too. It's like this kind of crazy, I don't know if it's coincidental or just logical at this point, but that $4 million gap that she's talking about, totally different analysis. When we looked at the average per yeah. people expenditure, in the presentation I did at Tom meeting that showed um, Duxbury versus, it was a different set of towns. Mm. I, I just made this comment at Tom meeting that if you just funded us at the average, of these towns, there would have been about a $4 million gap. That's probably not coincidental. Mm. You know, I think the reality is we're about $4 million short. Yeah. And where we, I know where I would like to be. Yeah. But this is unreal. So, so I think that kind of provides a context for the next few, kind of next few discussions we have around the budget and what we should be aiming for. I think that going back to looking at the property tax, this whole discussion about re being a residential town, um, the, the way to increase revenue for schools or any other department in the town is, is either to grow revenue generally or to shift the allocation of revenue amongst departments. And you could argue that Duxbury, Duxbury's ability to grow the revenue is is limited because it hasn't got a commercial and industrial tax base. So 
assessed values are moving with the real estate market um, rather than, which is linked to the economy. But um, so, so I think that, um, that all reallocating the revenue is, is important. Duxbury should be funding its schools at a, at a reasonable level. Um, uh, but there may come a point at which we need to um, grow the revenue by overriding the two and a half limit. Because there's a fundamental inconsistency there if you go back to this chart, right? Our, <laughs> the two and a half percent increase every year in the absence of new growth, we have an underlying teacher contract which uh, is 82 percent of our costs and that's increasing at three percent per year ish right as is the rest of the town the town's labor contracts with its unionized employees are rising by three percent per year so having with in the absence of new growth to add on the two and a half percent is actually squeezing the budget year on year on year um, unless we do something different either with our uh, con labor contracts or we do an override to kind of catch up. Anyway. Excellent. Well, and the other argument is that real estate values are often tied to the schools, right? Performance yes. of the schools. So yes. then you don't want to devalue. See, the property is devalued in town because the schools are not being funded. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Okay. All right. Do we have any other correspondence, comments, issues, anything? I want just to get it on the record. Yeah. We usually, when we do the um, new positions for the mm -hmm. committee, the, the reorg, we usually go through that list of committees. So I just want to put it that we should have that on the agenda for the next meeting. Perfect. It makes sense that we didn't do it with yes. two missing members, but okay. let's just make sure we do that the next meeting. Yes. All right. Great. Oh, do we have the, there's no new scholarship? No. No, okay. no. That's just if needed. That's just yep. a standing item. Well, there was a potential. Okay. okay. There was a potential. Okay. Yeah. Any public comment? No public comment. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <clears throat> Such good stuff. <coughs> interesting. <coughs> kind of interesting. Is it, is, I mean, it's the, the debt piece. Right? Yeah. Because they're going to say it's tied to the school. That's why you're getting less because you're putting the money yeah. into the school building. So it doesn't have to be. Right. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of our. Discussions with the town, mm. like how does our spending on public safety compare to other towns? Like, do we have a bigger spend because, like, harbor master? You know, like a lot of towns are like harbor master. It could be, but then you know, we have a harbor master. We have various types of license fees that you should that, that should cover that. that. Yeah, and we have that robust fire department program being yeah. yeah. for the making money. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a balancing act. You know. Um, yeah. And no, I know. It's, um, I have it online here, but uh, yeah, it's 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 complicated. I'm sure. Is he going to put your presentation? Yeah. I'll find it. Julia, Julia, overnight field trip world language.